Okay. Hi there. Um, welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. It is a busy day for me today, so uh, I'm a little bit um, um, uh, having to shift gears here. Let's see. Um, looking at questions here. Uh, there's questions here about, um, uh, well, there's a question here about um, uh, sleep. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, you know, it's a really strange thing because one would think that uh, sleep being such a, a widespread kind of phenomenon that it will be completely understood why one sleeps, what the function of sleep is, or maybe it's just a biological mistake, so to speak. You know, people often say anything that happens in biology has to happen for a reason, that, that organisms can evolve absolutely anything, that organisms could evolve, uh, um, you know, 17 eyes and could evolve this and could evolve that if it was good for them to do that. It's kind of the, the, the theory of the anything is possible theory of evolution. It's not clear that that's correct because whatever an organism is supposed to have somehow has to grow as part of the organism's development. So if you, know, if you were going to have wheels, there has to be a way to actually grow a wheel. Um, and uh, if there isn't, then even if it might be a really good thing to have wheels, um, you're not going to be able to have organisms that, that have those. But in any case, sleep is one of those things where people have sort of debated what is the function of sleep um, endlessly. And uh, there are a whole variety of theories, and I think it's, it's still quite up in the air what the, what the correct story is. I mean, one of the more perhaps amusing theories is the function of sleep is to keep animals out of the way at night so they don't uh, uh, cause trouble for themselves. Um, I think that's, that's, to me, what seems rather one of the more implausible theories. Um, but you know, if you look at what organisms sleep, um, I think going down to certainly fish and things like that, there is a very definite uh, different state that um, uh, organisms get into when they're sort of not, um, uh, not in their standard sort of conscious awake state. I mean, some organisms, I think uh, cartilaginous fish sharks and so on have all kinds of elaborate things where they can, you know, one half of their brain can go to sleep and the other one doesn't, all sorts of weird things like that. Um, but generally this idea of multiple states of the brain, ones that are awake and sort of paying attention and ones that are asleep and somehow uh, doing something that uh, um, <clears throat> provides rest for the organism, that seems to exist across a, a wide spectrum of different kinds of organisms. And we certainly know uh, for, for us, when we sleep, if you look at the, the brain waves that we generate, the electrical activity in our brains, all our, all our various hundred billion neurons are all little things that have electrical impulses that they're generating a thousand times a second or whatever that uh, make our brains operate the way they operate. But if you look at that on a sort of large scale, you just say, what's the, what's the average amount of electrical activity in the brain? You can see these kind of waves that go, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a prominent one, the alpha rhythm at around nine, uh, nine cycles per second. Um, but there is another one, I think it's the theta rhythm, which starts up when one goes to sleep. And that seems to be a, a kind of a, 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 um, a feature, a large scale feature of the brain that's characteristic of sleep. So, okay, so what does sleep do for one? Well, there are, there are theories like um, sleep. Uh, uh, well, uh, okay, another thing to say is that there are um, different phases of sleep, you know, even typical um, uh, uh, fitness trackers will often give you some trace of the different stages of sleep. Um, and they do that by, by, uh, by noticing uh, two basic things, noticing your heart rate and noticing whether you're wiggling around or not. Um, because in different phases of sleep, the, um, uh, the, the sort of you're completely still or, you, um, or, you're kind of, or your muscles are kind of wiggling around. Um, there are, I think, uh, well, the, 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 um, there's uh, several stages of sleep. There's kind of light sleep, deep sleep, and uh, REM sleep. Um, REM sleep is kind of the most, perhaps the most bizarre. Um, it's one where REM stands for rapid eye motion. 
and uh, your eyes kind of move around all over the place. Um, I guess that's the phase of sleep in which dreams occur. And um, whether you remember your dreams is probably somewhat related to whether you happen to wake up soon after you've been in a, a REM sleep period or not. I think, I think REM sleep, if I'm remembering correctly, is, is the period in which uh, you kind of, in which all motion is kind of cut off. So you're, you're, while your brain may be thinking about moving around, um, it's uh, your actual muscles are not. Um, that's probably an evolutionarily good thing because otherwise you'd be flopping around in, in, um, uh, and um, if you were an organism that slept in a tree or something, that might be a very bad thing for you. Um, but um, I think the, um, uh, the, the question, the function, uh, you know, what's happening in, in um, uh, there's sort of a question of why, uh, why does REM sleep occur? Why do dreams occur? Um, uh, the, the, um, the, there, are, there are different kinds of ideas about that. I mean, I think one thing that is pretty clear is that dreams are sort of related to an internally generated stimulus and then your brain trying to make sense of that internally generated stimulus. I mean, we know that our brains are constantly trying to sort of fill things in that seem plausible given some particular stimulus that we had. I mean, a very famous example of that um, is if you, um, uh, it's a visual uh, kind of hack. Um, so if you have your eye, um, your eye has your retina at the back of your eye, which is the part that senses light. It's kind of like the, um, the array of uh, the, the sort of uh, pixel array inside a, a standard digital camera these days, the array of, there's an array of cells on the back of your retina, it's a little hexagonal grid basically. And there are about, um, uh, there are, let's see, I think there are about a million pixels there, but they sort of uh, multiply up to about 10 million pixels when they do a little bit of local image processing um, to do that. Um, and um, that, but anyway, so, what, what happens is the light falls on your retina. It, um, uh, these, these, um, when, when light falls there, just like in a digital camera, the, um, uh, where the light falls, a little electrical impulse is generated. There's a, a cell that is a photoreceptor that has the feature that when a photon of light hits it, um, it produces an electrical pulse. Those electrical pulses are collected up and are fed to one's optic nerve that goes from the retina, the eye, to the visual cortex, uh, which is rather badly designed by being at the back of one's head. So the, the, the optic nerve has to go all the way through, through the, the brain to get to the back of um, uh, the back um, where the first levels of processing of, of the visual scene happen. But in any case, the, um, so one of the features is uh, where the, you have your retina. And again, it's maybe not such spectacular design. The, um, the optic nerve um, actually attaches to the eye on a part of the retina. And so what you, what you see is there's the retina and then there's a place on the retina where there aren't any photoreceptors because that's kind of where the optic nerve is getting all its connections from the, the, the photoreceptors on the retina and taking them, taking them uh, out to, uh, uh, through your brain. So that means that on your retina, there's a hole where there are no photoreceptors. You can't see anything on that part of your, your, um, uh, your eye. And so the, for humans, the optic nerve is on the, uh, sort of on the inside. So both eyes are sort of this blind spot um, that is you know, on the nose side of the eye, so to speak. Okay, so the trick you can do is you cover one eye, you get a piece of graph paper and you, you can write a big spot on the graph paper. And if you move your eye to the right distance and you keep focus straight ahead, then that big spot that you drew on the graph paper will end up being exactly where your optic nerve is it will it will correspond to that 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 image will fall on the part of your retina that corresponds to where your optic nerve is going and where you have no photoreceptors so you cannot see that that big blob that you put down on the graph paper so what does your brain do about that well what your brain does is it, it just fills in graph paper there it's it doesn't the, you know you ignore the fact that there's you, you can't see the blob but then the question is do you just leave a blank a, this is missing, missing data, as a computer might, might want to tell you. Well, missing data is filled in as something by your brain. And it's filled in your brain tends to say, well, what are the sort of patterns of what's going on here? Let me fill it in according to extending the pattern of what's going on there. And so you get the sort of extension of the graph paper, even though if you move your eye, you can see there's a great big blob there.
So this is a very typical thing that our brains do. It's something that we now know that artificial neural nets are also very good at doing, is kind of taking what we know happens in the world and kind of extrapolating, kind of deducing what the consequences, you know, fill in the pieces that, that you couldn't actually see, but were a sort of the natural thing that your brain sort of has seen examples of before that kind of are what might happen. And I think the, the, the general, the general assumption is that dreams are kind of that story, that there's some sort of internal stimulus. And then you're like, well, if, if this happened, then your brain fills in, well, this and this and this and this must happen. And so, you know, when there are sort of psychological interpretations of dreams, I think a lot of that story is about, well, those are the things that your brain is used to saying have to happen. And so when that sort of this random stimulus comes in, and then your brain says, well, that means I must be uh, you know, in this situation, that situation, whatever. Um, those are the things that are sort of that that have been imprinted on your in your in your mind um, as sort of what typically happens if this happens. So so they do provide some uh, some sort of uh, insight into the way that you're thinking about things, even if that's not the way that you would sort of consciously surface what you would say. They're the things that your brain has kind of decided are the natural thing that happens. You know, when you run into this person, the natural thing that happens is that the person, uh, you know, says something terrible or whatever. That, that's, um, that's what your brain has sort of decided is, um, is going on even if you couldn't necessarily verbalize and, and consciously say that. And I think that's kind of what, what, what people assume is happening in the case of dreams. But, you know, there's a question of what's actually going on in the brain um, when, um, when one's sleeping, what, what's, um, I think the, the most plausible theory, I suspect, is that there's just gunk that builds up in our brains when we, when we operate our brain during the day. Um, we uh, uh, we just um, uh, you know we the, the brain is active. There's some um, uh, there's little uh, you know uh, electrical pulses. Each electrical pulse is associated with a chemical process. The chemical process has a certain amount of waste product, um, probably. And uh, sleep is probably the time when it's okay. Shut everything down. Stop doing all that thinking stuff and just clean out the the waste products that got generated by by the activity during during the day. Um, I think adenosine, a particular uh, chemical, is one that's been implicated as being the thing that you have to clean out. And I, I guess it's, it's sort of uh, uh, the process of cleaning it out. As I say, you have to kind of shut things down to kind of wipe it all clean and be ready for the next day. Uh, now, you know, it, it's um, an, an, in a sense, I think one has the, uh, it's a little bit like what happens when one, you know, moves one's muscles. You know, when one moves one's muscles, what's happening is there's uh, the, the nerves are sending an electrical signal to the muscles. Muscles are made of these uh, proteins, actin, which is this long filamentous protein. And when, when it's uh, subjected to this uh, electrical pulse from, from a nerve, it will, con uh, it will, be con it will contract. Um, but that whole process of, of giving the energy to do that is, is part of a whole um, sort of cycle of energy production, which has a, um, uh, which has a, a kind of waste product, which is lactic acid. And so when you kind of move your muscles around, um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not completely certain whether that's, um, uh, to what extent that is the electrochemistry of the nerve versus the, um, uh, versus the pure muscle activity that leaves over the lactic acid. But in any case, the, the, um, you, uh, uh, you do this and uh, you generate lactic acid. And that's the kind of the thing when your muscles kind of, you know, feeling tired, that's some, um, uh, that's a thing that has built up there, and you have to kind of um, uh, wait to clear that out for your muscles to be not tired anymore. And, and one assumes that something pretty similar is happening in the brain. Certainly, that's one's perception when one feels tired. I, I think it's sort of one's perception is a little bit like muscles feeling tired. And certainly, the same word is used to describe those two, at least in English. So, so you know, a, a, a plausible theory is there's just waste products built up in the brain, and, and that's some um, what you have to clear out. Now, there are some more exotic theories that say things like, oh, uh, you know, when, when the brain is sleeping, it's reorganizing the memories that has been formed during the day. Might be true. I think we don't have as much evidence for that as we might think, given that we now understand artificial neural networks, which really don't seem to need a phase like that. You might think, oh, our memories are stored in these very complicated ways in our brain. You know, let's try and organize our memories. 
Um, I, it doesn't seem to be, artificial neural nets don't do that. Um, and they haven't seemed to have a need for that. Now, one thing that probably is true is that rehearsing our memories, like there are things you know, that I learned 50 years ago or something that um, if I haven't thought about them in 50 years, um, maybe there's much less chance that I will remember them than if I kind of have rehearsed them multiple times in that, in that intervening period. I mean, it, it's, it's part of the, um, uh, I mean, the, this whole question about how you best remember things, people have studied this quite a bit. It's kind of like, um, uh, you know, if you're trying to um, uh, learn things for a test or something, you know, what's the optimal way to do it? What's the optimal kind of repetition period? Do you have uh, what, what, what people look at in sort of the psychology world is this idea of learning curves. If you're, if you're learning something, um, what, um, uh, you know, but by what, uh, you know, as you, as you repeat sort of trying things out, how, how rapidly do you become successful at doing that particular task? You know, if you're trying to, I don't know, um, uh, do some kind of um, uh, thing in a video game, or you're trying to do some manual task where you're, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, tying some weird knot or you're throwing something in some particular way, how many trials does it take before you reach what level of proficiency in doing that particular task. That's the kind of story of the learning curve. And typically what happens is there's a sort of, uh, typically it's a kind of a rapid beginning where you learn, you know, you get quite a lot, you get faster, you get better at doing that task quite, quite quickly and then it kind of slows down and eventually you reach some kind of saturation where you're at the maximum stage. And it's kind of when you practice something, you know, you practice the piano, you practice something else. This is all sort of trying to push up this learning curve to get to the point where you have sort of rehearsed things enough that, um, uh, that you can be successful at doing them. You've, you've sort of trained yourself to be able to do them. And I think this, this notion of training, which certainly humans have understood well for a long time, whether you're you know, training yourself to do some particular kind of thing so you can, you can do it well and you can do it even without thinking too much about it. You can just sort of naturally do it um, just because you've trained yourself to do it. It's really the same story in, in the artificial neural networks that we use today, except they don't really have the thinking phase. They just have to be trained to, uh, uh, to do the thing. So uh, let's see, what else to say about sleep? I think that the, you know, another thing is it's very common in biology. Once you have some big uh, phenomenon that's happening, Biology says, okay, great, there's this phenomenon happening. Let's pile on a lot of other things that can be put into that other sort of, uh, that, that can be put along with that phenomenon. So once we know we sleep, so to speak, then let's go and let's have all kinds of uh, uh, sort of endocrine uh, functions that uh, correlate with that. Let's have these other kinds of things that correlate with that and so on. So, so the things that, that there end up being all these things that happen when one is asleep, which one doesn't really know what's cause and what's effect. What was it that sleep is needed because of clearing out stuff from the brain or something? And then by the way, given that you're just lying still for, for however many hours, um, then, then um, uh, we might as well also do these things while, while you're asleep. And, and evolution sort of led one to say, let's put these functions um, in the time when, when one is asleep. Uh, you know, there are also questions about sort of how often does one sleep and how much does one need to sleep and so on. There's this whole notion of the circadian rhythm, the fact that, you know, we, we roughly, we live on a planet that has a roughly a 24 hour day. And uh, so we roughly end up synchronizing our sleep wakefulness to that 24 hour period. Um, and uh, uh, the sort of the way that that seems to happen is largely uh, through this very simple process of we see light, light comes into our eyes, uh, sort of uh, a, a, a decently intense light ends up being the thing that sort of drives kind of the, the synchronization of our circadian rhythm. And, and ultimately it's, it's something where um, the uh, pituitary gland, I guess, in the brain is involved in secreting um, various chemicals, melatonin and things like this, that uh, are associated with uh, the, the, the process of, of sleep and wakefulness. But, but pretty soon, if, if you've been sort of driven by, oh, the sun is coming up and going down and, and everything's on this 24-hour cycle, your body will adapt to, yes, it's going to follow this 24-hour cycle. Um, so uh, when, uh, for example, if, for, for every particular person, I don't know whether it varies with time of life or not, but if you, if you were actually sort of... Uh, 
putting yourself in this completely darkened room. You don't know anything about what time it is. You have no clocks, computers, clock is switched off, all that kind of thing. Your circadian rhythm will drift. And most people have a circadian rhythm that's either a bit longer, a bit shorter than, than 24 hours. And so you'll, you'll kind of see yourself um, not aligning anymore to the sun. And um, it's only when you're sort of being driven in some way, uh, more, most directly, I think, by light, um, that, uh, that you end up lining up that way. And, and you know, when, when you change time zones, if you travel to the other side of the world where you're off by you know, eight time zones or something, um, so that, um, that then you end up getting this jet lag phenomenon where you have a whole elaborate sort of uh, resynchronization that has to happen. And so it's kind of an awkward one because actually it turns out, it seems like every cell in your body has some knowledge of this kind of whole 24 hour overall cycle. And so when you are sort of uh, resetting it, maybe you, but, but by an eight hour reset or something, um, you end up having to slowly over the course of weeks or even months um, sort of reset the circadian rhythm of all those cells. And certainly I've, I've noticed you know, times when I've been sort of uh, traveling around the world and getting jet lag and so on, there are all these elaborate phenomena that happen where you kind of have a reflection 12 hours away from where you would normally go to sleep, you start feeling tired and, and you can actually work out the equations for some of these things and you can have some understanding of what the, um, uh, what, what, the, what, way, what the way that works is. And actually one can imagine and, and some people actually, um, uh, was some nice uh, work done with our open language technology to, um, uh, to figure out sort of what is the optimal way to pace yourself. Um, if you know you're traveling to a place that's an eight hour uh, time difference away, you know, in the days before you go and in the days after you arrive, you know, what, when should you go to sleep and get up again so that you minimize the kind of the effects of this uh, sort of phase resetting of your circadian rhythm. Um, anyway, that, that's, a, that's a, a few thoughts about, um, about sleep. Let's see. Um, okay, there's a question about triangles and the significance of triangles. I can talk a little bit about that. So you have a triangle. And one feature of a triangle is if, if it has, if its corners sort of are, are just loosely attached, they're just sort of, um, they're, they're, they can pivot, they can they can deform they can get um, the angles can get larger and smaller one feature of a triangle is it's rigid and so in other words once once you have a triangle with its three side lengths there's no way you can kind of squidge it if you had a, if you had a quadrilateral a four-sided thing then yeah you might have a square but if if the angles can change you can just deform it to being a, a parallelogram it doesn't have to stay a square there's a, there's a theorem uh, due to a French mathematician in the 1800s that is the statement that the triangle is the only uh, structure that is uh, uh, rigid in that sense. I think that's right. Um, the, um, uh, that, that has this feature that you can't, um, uh, that if you just define the lengths of the sides, um, but you don't define the angles, the, the lengths of the sides alone will define its angles. And so if you make a mechanical structure out of uh, a triangle, it, 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 there's no way, if, if, if you maintain the side lengths, there's no way that the thing can kind of squidge over. So, so what? Well, if you look at a lot of uh, metal work on bridges and things like that, you'll see these trusses. And these trusses are all made with a bunch of triangles. And the reason for that is exactly this phenomenon. If there were squares, then, then that square could kind of deform and the bridge could sort of uh, fall over or whatever. But, but uh, because, you know, steel or something the bridge is made out of is, is quite, it, it doesn't, okay, the, the, the thing to understand is there are materials like steel that if you take them and you try and, you try and bend them, they do successfully bend. But if you try and squash them, they don't, uh, actually the, the best example of that, okay, the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the, if, if that, yes, the, well, it's, it's true for steel, but it's even more true for some other materials that, you know, it, it, if you try and sort of squash it from the ends, it will be hard to, to compress it. But if you just try and uh, try and bend it in the middle, it's, it's much easier to bend. And so that's, that's a reason why it's a good idea to make these trusses where you make these little triangular pieces, because then what's happening is each one of those triangular pieces, 
um, uh, it, it can't change its, its shape without changing the lengths of the sides, but the lengths of the sides as, you know, have, a, have a strong material that can't be compressed there. Um, and so it pre it's prevented from, from changing the lengths of its sides. So that was a thing that's been known in engineering for a really long time, that, um, that if you have these sort of members, these, these struts and things, that the way you make a strong structure is you have to have a bunch of triangles in it. And that's, that's because the, the triangle is the shape that doesn't deform um, when, uh, if you keep the lengths of the sides constant. So there, there are other ways of getting sort of fairly stable structures. There's a whole family of stable, fairly stable structures, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to completely do this justice. There's this, uh, there was this chap called Buckminster Fuller, who was a kind of colorful character who studied a lot kind of the forms and shapes of things. And he was uh, very big on this idea that he called tensegrity. Um, and the idea there is sort of a generalization of this, what doesn't deform when you do certain kinds of operations. And uh, in particular, uh, he was very big on the idea of making geodesic domes, which are so, so okay, so if you have a, um, uh, how do you make a, a dome out of um, just sort of little struts? What's the best way to make it? Well, let's say you made a, um, uh, a thing that was just a bunch of equilateral triangles, just a, a grid of equilateral triangles. That would just lie flat. If everything is triangles, it just lies flat. If everything is hexagons, it also lies flat, or squares. Those are all things where you can just make sort of tiles that are just pure squares, pure hexagons, pure equilateral triangles, and you can just lay them as a flat tiling. Um, those, are, those are examples of, of cases where, where the tiling is flat. But now imagine that, see, see whether you can do that with pentagons, with regular pentagons. You try and fit those pentagons together. If you fit a bunch of regular pentagons together, they won't lie flat. In fact, if you just start with one regular pentagon, you put other regular pentagons around it, um, what you'll make is the net of a, of a shape of a dodecahedron. Um, and so what will happen is the only way to have those next hexagons, be, these pentagons be, be have their sides right next to each other is to curl them up into a dodecahedron, into a, into a 12-faced object. So, so if, you have, if you have hexagons, you can make an infinite flat tiling. If you have pentagons, you can, you can, uh, the only thing you can make is this dodecahedron, which curls up like a kind of discrete version of a sphere. So the idea that um, uh, uh, exists in geodesic domes and so on is what if you mix hexagons and pentagons? So it's mostly hexagons, but there are a few pentagons in there. So, so that means that it doesn't, things can't lie completely flat because you've got these pentagons that don't let it be completely flat. They add some curvature to the whole thing. Well, there's one sort of famous example of, of where that's done, which is in soccer balls. Soccer balls have a mixture of, uh, if you look at kind of the stitching on them, they have a, a mixture of hexagons and pentagons. And um, they are, uh, and that's, and, and so if they were pure pentagons, then they wouldn't be able to be a, a, an approximation to a sphere. They would just be dodecahedral soccer balls, which might be kind of interesting to, to operate with. But um, if you want to make a soccer ball that's really a ball, but you want to make it out of more or less flat pieces, you have to mix hexagonal pieces with pentagonal pieces. And the, the fewer pentagons you have in there, the flatter things will be. So if you want to make a really, really big dome, you would have a bunch of hexagons and not so many pentagons in it. But so this idea, of, of making geodesic domes, for example, out of a mixture of, um, of hexagons and pentagons. That's, that's sort of an example. And there's a, there's a sense in which there's stability. There's this kind of tensegrity form of stability that you get um, when there is a sort of a, a mixture of, of a force due to gravity, for example, together with the, um, the kind of stability of having these struts arranged in a particular way. So that, that's... Um, now, actually, you know, when it comes to geodesic domes, you know, uh, old uh, Buckminster Fuller, you know, came up with them and, and started uh, building. They were used for, they've been used for all kinds of things. Uh, famously, there's one at Disney World, and um, that was an early one that I think Buckminster Fuller did. There's ones um, in a bunch of different places that they're commonly used. You know, if you see like a, uh, some kind of um, uh, radar uh, you know, or, or a satellite tracking thing, there'll typically be a GD6 dome that covers it just because it's a convenient way to make sort of a dome-like thing. Um, and uh, 
So geodesic domes sort of started getting used in the 1950s, 1960s by, by us humans, but they've been used by other things a very, very long time. So, so the, the sort of idea of making a sphere out of, out of, um, out of these sort of uh, uh, polygonal pieces, well, it's used in, in biology quite a bit. It's used in, for example, radiolaria, kind of the things, the little tiny organisms that you find in the ocean where they have a, um, uh, a sort of skeleton made of, um, uh, what is it, organosilicates. Um, that's a, uh, it's some kind of, um, it's something a little bit like sort of a, a piece of, a tiny piece of rock, sort of a, a crystal that's like a tiny piece of rock, but they tend to form into these kinds of shapes. Same with pollen grains, same with some, some kinds of virus coats, although virus coats are often actually icosahedral, for example, um, rather than forming into, into these um, kind of more approximately spherical shapes. But so the, there are a bunch of places where that, um, uh, where that sort of idea has been used before. So anyway, the, 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 um, uh, but the point is that there's sort of a, a, an elaborate analysis that you can make of given these geometrical shapes, what, what kind of stability do you get and what, to what extent can you approximate spheres and, and all kinds of things like this. But triangles are really special because they have this property that allows you to kind of make trusses that, are, that don't, um, uh, don't deform in that way. Um, and the, well, there, there are all kinds of other sort of clever ideas about using different geometries you know, making these kind of honeycomb things where they where they deform in one direction, they don't deform in the other direction, all those kinds of things. Also, people have made molecules that are uh, the shape of geodesic domes or geodesic spheres, so to speak, mixtures of uh, hexagonally connected um, atoms and pentagonally connected atoms. They're usually called buckyballs, and they're most famously made out of carbon. Um, and uh, you can make these different sizes, shapes of uh, sizes of, of uh, approximately spherical kind of cages of of, uh, of carbon that um, potentially are useful for things. That the more useful form is this thing called graphene, which is kind of a tube-like version of the same kind of idea that has all kinds of interesting properties of, of being a very good electrical conductor, like a wire, and and potentially very strong. And you can kind of uh, um, imagine using them for all kinds of purposes. But I think the the actual um, the, the spherical cages also are, are potentially useful as well. All right, let's see. Um, there's a question here, actually quite related to this, from Mikhail about are quasi crystals useful? Okay, what is a quasi crystal? So I was explaining to you that if you have a um, uh, if you're trying to tile a plane, you're trying to you know, put tiling down in your bathroom or something, what shapes of tiles can you use? Well, you can use square tiles, just put the tiles all one down next to each other. You can use hexagonal tiles, you can use triangular tiles, but you cannot use regular pentagons as tiles. And actually, there's a limited set of shapes you can use. There's some other tilings you can use if you, if you allow a pair of tiles. You can use, there's a very nice tiling, sometimes called the Kepler tiling, that is a mixture of octagons and squares. So you have an octagon, octagons on their own can't, regular octagons, regular eight-sided figures on their own can't be used to make a tiling. But if you mix them with an octagon and then uh, uh, four squares around, the, around some of the edges of the octagon, then you can make this combined octagons and squares tiling and you can just continue the tiling forever. So one question is, when you make one of these tilings, does it is it repetitive? You know, if you have a square tiling, you just have a row of squares here, another row of squares here, another row of squares here. All those rows of squares are identical. So wherever you were on this kind of tiling floor, it would always look the same. It would always be be identical. It would be in, invariant under sort of moving around. It would be unchanged under moving around on the, on the floor, so to speak. The question is: Is that always the way things work? Or is there an arrangement of, is, are there tiles that have the property that there is a way to fill the infinite you know, bathroom floor or whatever, but um, you can't do it periodically. You can't do it so that there's always a repeating pattern that just goes the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. It's the same, let's say, pair of tiles that you're using, but the detailed arrangement of that pair of tiles um, can be completely different um, in different places. Well. People didn't know this, and back in the 1940s, there started to be some results that came from thinking about the theory of computation that basically showed that there could exist infinite tilings, but 
the infinite tilings will be very computationally complicated. They will be very, they would be, um, I mean, in, in um, essentially what will be happening is as a sort of model of computation, a Turing machine, um, and essentially what will be happening is the, the, um, the model of computation involves, you just have this, this tape, this one dimensional tape, and essentially the Turing machine would be kind of making one row of the tile, tiling the next row, the next row, the next row. And the question of whether there was an infinite tiling would be the question of whether the Turing machine would never halt in, its, um, in, in just generating successive rows of the tiling. And that turns out to be a computationally difficult problem. And that kind of shows that there exist tilings which are messy and complicated, where there is a tiling is possible, but it's messy and complicated. So, so then various things were discovered and, and eventually, um, uh, Roger Penrose, who's somebody I've known for a long time, uh, who also is famous because um, uh, he's a mathematical physicist who won this year's um, Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on, on black holes and, and the study of the geometry of space time. But um, when he was much younger, um, he's very much into sort of mathematical puzzles and so on. And he discovered, invented, I'm not sure how you say it, these things that are usually called Penrose tiles which are a pair of tiles that have the property that there is a way to make them fill up the whole plane, but there's no way to do that periodically. And essentially the way they work is, well, there's a, a kite shaped tile and there's a dart shaped tile. Um, and uh, essentially what happens is um, you can lay down a particular pattern of these sort of kites and darts. And then you can imagine taking that pattern and kind of uh, uh, sort of um, taking a sub piece of it and you end up with this kind of nested structure of sort of patterns and sub patterns and so on. And that's that in that nested pattern, it's possible to have the kites and darts fill up the plane infinitely, but only in, but, but it's not possible to do that, having them be periodic, be, be just a repeating pattern. There's, there's other ways to make them fill the plane other than this nested pattern, but the nested pattern proves that it is possible for them to fill the whole plane. So actually, I've been long curious whether there is a simpler version of that. So it's known that there's no single tile in one dimension, in, in two dimensions, at least just on a plane. There's no single tile that lets you uh, forces non-periodicity, but allows tiling. It's not known in three dimensions. It's possible there could be a three dimensional shape that could fill space where you could, you could arrange it all together, but um, it doesn't... Um, uh, it doesn't do that periodically. At least I believe that's, um, that, that's not known whether that's possible. So in, even in two dimensions, um, there's sort of the question of, of okay, so th there's something where there's no periodic tiling that's possible, but there is this nested tiling that Penrose tiles allow. Can one find a simple tile set of tiles that will allow um, not just, um, uh, that, that will force you to have some much more complicated pattern where the only way to tile the plane is something much more complicated. So that, uh, in, in a sense, what you, if you can find that, then insofar as actual atoms, and, and let's say you can get at something which is molecules that are those shapes, then if you say, well, I'm going to let, I'm going to, I'm going to have this liquid where all these molecules are just running around randomly, and I'm going to cool it down, and it's going to become a crystal where all those molecules are lined up, and the only way they can line up is in this very complicated arrangement. Then this is a way to kind of uh, create an object with a very complicated arrangement at the atomic scale. We don't usually have that. In a crystal, in a standard crystal, the atoms are all arranged in, a, in this very periodic way. Unless there's a defect in the crystal or unless there are different um, uh, uh, parts of the crystal, a, a twin, twin crystal or something like that, um, you don't, um, different domains of the crystal, within a single part of the crystal, all the atoms are precisely lined up in, let's say, a hexagonal arrangement, a cubic arrangement, uh, they're different, they're, they're a, um, 17 standard arrangements of, of um, uh, in three dimensions for possible ways that, that crystals can be, can be arranged. But um, it's basically uh, most of the time, the atoms that we know, it's kind of like it's one of those standard periodic arrangements and nothing else. So something that was discovered in the 1980s um, is that actually there are ways of making uh, quasi crystals where the atoms can arrange themselves, but they can't arrange themselves periodically. And in particular, they can arrange themselves in these nested patterns, a bit like Penrose tiles. Actually, strangely enough, the, the three-dimensional logo 
of, uh, of Wolf Alpha and of our company is this uh, rhombic hexacontahedron. And that object actually is one of the sort of uh, uh, elements that can be used to build up a three-dimensional uh, quasi-periodic tiling. Um, so uh, quasi, quasi crystal. Okay, so why are these quasi crystals um, uh, uh, relevant or interesting? Um, I think the, um, there are a variety of, of strange features that they have, um, particularly having to do with um, uh, the extent to which that the lack of periodicity has effects on the way that periodic things like light waves and so on, which are periodic, will go through the crystal. I suspect that there are things that one can do that will be really spectacular if you could kind of more design in detail the precise kind of form of that, um, of that sort of uh, uh, semi-random pattern, random but repeatable pattern. There are probably a lot of things one could do, uh, things like um, oh, phys so-called physically unique functions, which are a way of kind of uh, having a password that's burnt into hardware. There's some probably things, some things along those lines. There are probably a bunch of other things that could be done. We don't know how to make these kind of uh, not really quasi crystals, but non crystals, so to speak, where the atoms are always arranged the same in the same kind of a way, but never arranged periodically. So I, I, I may be I may be forgetting some um, some amazing uses of quasi crystals, but that's some um, uh, that that's that's at least a beginning and, and talking a little bit about what quasi crystals are. Let's see, maybe one more. Um, uh, one more question here. Um, okay, there's a question from Pratik. Um, what does it mean to map a brain? Why is there a race to map the brain correctly? Well, our brain has about 100 billion neurons in it. And it is the connections between those neurons that seem to be the key to sort of how our brains work. Um, the, uh, our brains are pretty complicated and, and none of us have the same way in which those, those uh, individual neurons are connected together. If you go to much lower organisms, um, you will find uh, that with much tinier brains, you will find that sometimes their brains are always hooked up in the same way. So the most famous example of that is this tiny little nematode worm, the C. elegans, which has uh, about 2,000 um, uh, cells altogether in it. Um, each nematode is about 2,000 cells, and they're always arranged the same way. Well, actually, the male organism is arranged one way, the female organism another way, but the, the cells are, are basically arranged the same in all of these, in, in every one of these organisms. And when the organism grows, the, the, you know, the cells divide, and they always divide in the same way to make the same shape. And the brain of that organism, I think it's, what is it, 500 or so uh, neurons, something like that, I, I forget. Um, the, the one feature that the, the C. elegans has is its brain is always arranged the same way. The neurons are always arranged in exactly the same uh, configuration. And um, you, can, you can kind of trace, oh, if you poke you know, one piece of the, of, the, of the critter, then that will excite this neuron, which excites this neuron, which will eventually make the, the foot of the thing move. And that's kind of the full story of how its brain works. You can trace every every sort of connection in its brain and you can kind of see the wiring diagram that says the, the electric circuit in effect that determines the, the, the structure of its brain. Well, we can't expect to do that for us, for us because our brains don't grow that way. We don't all grow identical brains. Perhaps that's a good thing. Otherwise we might all uh, behave in absolutely identical ways and, and the world would probably be a, a, a less interesting place and a place less likely to, to see sort of innovation and change and and the kinds of things that probably are good for biological evolution. But um, the thing that, um, that we can do is even though the individual neurons in our brains are not uh, hooked up in, in, a, in, a, in a repeatable way, the areas of our brains are, are quite repeatable. So we'll have you know, the visual cortex in the back of our head, the, 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 the um, uh, I don't know all my brain parts, the, the sort of frontal lobes in the front, the motor strip on the top, you know, all sorts of other features of the brain will be arranged in very definite places. Now, if you, if you look at an individual brain, and I'm, I'm happy to say I've never done that in, in, in person, so to speak, but um, if, you, 
uh, the brains are, uh, they have all this, uh, with humans, they have all this sort of corrugation. They're very, they're, they're kind of like a, a flat surface, but they've all been, been, been scrunched up like a, like a crumpled piece of paper. And, and the details of how that sort of crumpling and folding works are very different between different brains. They're even more different than the fingerprints, which are also sort of a, a folding related phenomenon. Um, so different brains kind of very, very have a very different detailed, um, detailed structure like that. But still, there are features that are, that are very similar. And um, there's sort of a question of to what extent can we deduce kind of global, uh, a global sort of architecture for the brain? Um, and uh, then how do we understand the connections between different parts of the brain, different, different parts that seem to be critical to, you know, our perception of consciousness, critical to our ability to, um, you know, assess risk, typical uh, of our ability to process language, all these kinds of things. It's known that um, there are the, the particular features of the brain, like the, the place that's most critical for processing language and so on, isn't always in quite the same place in different people. Um, and uh, for example, people who do neurosurgery and who are you know, trying to fix problems inside brains um, always need to kind of poke around and try and figure out things like, where is the language center? Because you really want to avoid that. But the things around it, one doesn't necessarily know what they do, and they may be the, the things that are less critical to, to sort of one's everyday uh, uh, operation. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that's just a kind of a, a weird trivia point is that, the, you know, the brain and human brains have, has two sides, left and right hemispheres, and they do somewhat different things. And there's always a question, if you're left-handed, as I am, um, you know, 10% of, uh, of humans are left-handed. Uh, I happen to be one of that 10%. Um, one's brain is arranged, uh, the, the arrangement is not necessarily the same as a right-handed um, uh, uh, right person. And so, for example, when there are studies that are done of kind of brain activity where people are using functional MRI imaging to, for example, figure out which, which areas of the brain are being used when you think about uh, elephants or something, um, it there is some overall difference of organization that seems to exist often for left-handed people compared to right-handed people. And so when people do these studies, they usually say, oh, we're recruiting, you know, I don't know, students of this type who have this and this and this, no left-handers. So one, one of my kids has always been disappointed that uh, she's always excluded from these, these kinds of studies. I think she told me she recently found a study uh, 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 the, where, where they're like, yes, we'll have left-handed people, but I think it may have been a study to do with something to do with left-handedness. So, so that may not be a, be a thing that really counts. But anyway, the, the, the thing that, um, uh, that's of interest is, you know, to what extent can we understand the architecture of the brain? To what extent can we map out how that works? It's not clear that, uh, I mean, perhaps there will be one day sort of a standard model of a human brain just as there's a standard human genome that, uh, you know, is the six billion base pairs of the human genome. Part of it came from one of the people uh, who, who uh, uh, figured out how to sequence the human genome. He sort of contributed his genome to be part of the standard, so to speak. Obviously, actual, each actual human has a somewhat different genome, unless they're identical twins. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, but you have to, you know, you can pick sort of a standard genome, and then you can say, how do people differ from that standard genome? One can imagine a time when there'll be sort of a standard brain, where it's like, this is the connections of the brain in some, some particular way. Well, there's some sort of questions about, could you actually map a brain? Could, if you took a human brain, um, could, you, could you successfully map it? Well, it's a lot easier if the brain is not alive anymore. If the brain is alive, it's pretty challenging to see how you would map it. The best idea that people have is this notion of optogenetics, where basically what you're doing is you're kind of entraining uh, uh, into, into sort of the, the, um, the, the proteins that are produced um, by the operation of, of, of the brain. You're introducing ones that produce, uh, produce light, like a jellyfish can produce light uh, using actually the same, same kind of uh, technology, so to speak. Um, you're introducing those in such a way that you can actually have within a brain, you might be able to sort of measure, um, you might be able to sort of detect this, this um, uh, you know, flashes of light that are produced and things. I suppose you could also detect, you know, you can to some extent measure the electrical signals associated with individual, uh, individual um, uh, neurons in the brain. 
uh, I mean, the, the brain is complicated partly because these neurons tend to be long and filamentous and each neuron might connect to a thousand other neurons and it's a big, it's a big mass of, of sort of neuron wires uh, going all over the place. It's hard to disentangle. But um, you, know, you could imagine you take a brain, you kind of um, uh, completely freeze it you kind of have it, uh, you put in some, um, some chemical that will just like, like take, um, uh, you know, there are chemicals where, which will basically just put sort of handcuffs on every protein and, and prevent it, anything from moving around. You could say, well, then let's go take that and let's kind of just analyze, you know, slice by slice, let's go through and let's figure out exactly what was connected to what and exactly how many little, little um, channels are there inside the synapses that connect to one neuron to another and just sort of measure off exactly how our brain is working. And um, then you could imagine doing that. And you could imagine then saying, okay, if we know all the features of the brain that are important, and we've kind of measured them off, let's restart this brain in a digital form in a computer. And let's then just, uh, you know, then we'll have something which is kind of like, like a human brain. And that would be a neat thing to be able to do. We're not quite there yet in terms of computer power, but we're not super far away from being able to do that. Um, it's also not clear that you need to get to get human-like performance on things. You certainly don't necessarily need the precise copy of an individual human brain. If you had that precise copy, presumably, you would have something that would be able to respond in the same way that actual human brains respond. I mean, I don't know, and nobody really knows, to what extent you really need to go through and, and work out every single synapse and every single thing about the brain to make a thing that can imitate the operation of a brain. I mean, I've sometimes wondered, you know, I've collected uh, uh, several million emails and things, and I've collected a lot of detailed information about me and what I do and things like this. And, you know, these live streams are yet more data. And it's like, uh, at some point, you know, could you use all that data to basically make a bot of me that just is a, you know, that starts from sort of a, um, an un, untrained neural network of some kind, and then just feed it all of the stuff about, well, this is what, this is what I do about um, for this or that thing, just neural net, just imitate that. And, and can you sort of knit that together and expect to get something which is sort of a, a bot of me? But, but anyway, so the, the, this, um, this question of, uh, you know, can you map the brain at this microscopic level? Can you map the brain at a sort of larger architectural level? Um, can you get an understanding, a better understanding of how our brains are organized? And, and, you know, there's a sort of a question of to what extent when we try and make AI systems, artificial intelligence systems and so on, to what extent should we be imitating the way brains work? And to what extent should we just taking what's the overall thing you're trying to make it do and worry about that? I mean, it's, it's like asking if you're trying to make an airplane, to what extent does it need feathered wings and so on like a bird? Well, the answer is, you know, there aren't too many feathered wing airplanes that have ever worked. Um, the, 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 the details of, you know, making an airplane out of aluminum and having, you know, jet engines and things like that, very different from making a bird out of, out of bone and, uh, and feathers and so on and having it work that way. So, so it's not completely clear that one wants to have, um, you know, to what extent copying the, the details, you know, what level of detail of copying the human brain is useful. Um, but it's certainly interesting to know more about how brains work um, and uh, although we may very well find that quite a lot of, of the way the brain works is like, oh, you don't need that. That's, uh, you know, it's like saying, you know, do the wings of the airplane need to flap? No, they don't. Uh, you know, do you need feathers on the wings? No, you don't. If your purpose is to make a thing that, uh, you know, flies around and can take people in cargo and things like that, then it's perfectly adequate to have this aluminum thing with fixed wings. If your purpose was exactly to reproduce what, you know, what an owl does or something, then yes, you probably need an owl. And if you, if you get to enough level of detail, you probably need exactly an owl. So the question is when we're reproducing sort of brain-like things, what level of detail do we want to reproduce these things at? Um, and uh, that, that sort of determines um, how, how we should best think about it. All right, well, unfortunately I have to uh, wrap this up now, but um, uh, I see a, quite a number of interesting questions which I would have loved to, to tackle and um, perhaps we can leave them until next time. So thanks very much and uh, bye for now.